West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com The Washington Post reported late yesterday that Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance has convened a special grand jury to decide whether to bring criminal charges against former President Donald Trump, other executives at his company, or the company itself. According to the Post, the move indicates that after a more than two-year investigation with a lengthy legal battle for Trump's tax returns, Vance believes he may have found evidence of a crime somewhere in the Trump organization. The panel will sit for three days a week for the next six months, longer than a traditional New York grand jury assignment. People familiar with the matter told the paper. These sources say the Democratic prosecutors in investigators are scrutinizing Trump's business practices before he was president, including whether the value of specific properties in the Trump organization's real estate portfolio were manipulated in a way that defrauded banks and insurance companies, and if any tax benefits were obtained illegally through unscrupulous asset valuation. They're also looking into untaxed compensation to the company's chief financial officer, Alan Wieselberg, who investigators are trying to pressure into cooperating against his boss, the Post previously reported. A lawyer for Wieselberg, excuse me, declined to comment, but former President Trump issued a lengthy statement last night calling the grand jury, quote, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt in American history, somewhat confirming that it's happening. The Trump Organization has denied any wrongdoing. Let's bring in one of the reporters behind this story, investigative reporter for The Washington Post, David Farenthold. Also with us, former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid and professor at law at Georgetown University, Paul Butler is with us. David, thanks so much for being with us uh, and, and for bringing this reporting to us. Uh, what, what, what else can you tell us about this story? Well, we don't really know exactly who, who the target of this investigation is. We know the Trump Organization is the target. We don't know who they're going to present indictments against. Uh, what it does show us, as you said earlier, is that this has moved to a different phase. After spending more than two years gathering evidence, they're at the phase where the DA wants to go in front of a grand jury and start presenting that evidence, marshalling that evidence toward proving probable cause for a crime. They have a long time to do it. They have six months to do it. That's where they think they are. Uh, and that to us was a very uh, surprising and notable development. Any idea why it, this one is six months long, why this grand jury is a little longer than most grand juries? What we were told is that when you're dealing with white collar cases, fraud cases, public corruption cases, where there's lots of moving pieces, you want a grand jury that can sit long enough to hear all of that. They're probably going to hear a lot more evidence than an actual jury in a courtroom would. So you want people to, to people to come back and hear all the pieces. I imagine in this case they're going to hear from appraisers, accountants, taxing authorities, all kinds of people. Because you remember, there's different pieces of this, and every little piece of it is sort of complicated. So they're going to they're going to hear from a lot of folks making a lot of complicated cases one after the other. 
David, more than anybody else uh, in journalism, you have uh, completely uh, immersed yourself in all things Trump as it pertains to financing, uh, both before he was in the White House and while he was in the White House. Uh, what do you suspect? And of course, I, I, I have I've, I've made it very clear to my audience that I absolutely you know, I loathe the fact that for the past five years, everybody, you know, there's a leak and everybody immediately thinks somebody's going to jail. I ask this question not and not presupposing that Donald Trump is going to, to even be indicted. But I'm just asking you as somebody who knows this material better than anybody else on the on the, on the, the in journalism. Where do you suspect uh, investigators are going to be looking, uh, where have they been looking based on your reporting, and, and what do you believe is at issue for, for Vance and his team to decide whether a charge is brought or not? Well, we know from other uh, public filings and from subpoenas we've reviewed that, that, that the DA is interested at least in the, the same transactions that the, the New York Attorney General has been talking about, which is uh, transactions where Trump valued his assets quite high in order to impress lenders and have people think he's a good credit risk, and then devalue those assets, in some cases perhaps too much, in order to save on his taxes, to get tax breaks from conservation easements. And then in one case, he got $100 million plus million worth of debt forgiven, and there's questions about whether he actually paid the proper income tax in that forgiven debt. Uh, but you have to remember there's a whole universe out there of evidence we haven't seen yet, which is from Trump's tax returns. No one before Cy Vance had ever gotten a hold of that much information about Trump's finances. And from the little bit that I've seen of tax returns prepared by Donald Trump's folks, there are a lot of problems in the little bit that I've seen. So there could be a lot more problems in those millions of pages. The key for the so, DA, David, if they're going to go after... Hmm, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. The key, if they're going to go after Donald Trump personally, is to prove intent. And this is a complicated case. Trump, I'm sure, is going to say, I relied on my lawyers, I relied on my accountants. They have to find statements, witnesses, documents that show Trump knew what he was doing and did it anyway. So so there's there's a, one piece of property that uh, I don't think most of us are familiar with that keeps coming up north of the city. Uh, talk about that property and why that seems to always come up uh, in these stories and in and, and investigations uh, into Donald Trump's financing. You're right. I spent a lot of time covering the Trump Organization. This is one of the most obscure properties called Seven Springs. It's the biggest state uh, up in uh, Westchester County, New York. It used to actually be owned by the people who uh, owned the Washington Post years ago. Uh, and it's a huge estate, but Trump hasn't gone there for years and years and years. In fact, we've been told it's used to store old furniture. But it's gotten Trump in a lot of trouble because in 2015, Trump got what's called a conservation easement on that property. He said, I'm not going to develop this into houses. I have the right to, but I'm not going to. So I want a tax break for giving up those development rights. And he got a $21 million tax break. The problem was he didn't actually have the, pro the permissions to build those houses, and he might never have gotten them. He bought them for years and hadn't gotten the permissions he wanted. So the question is, did he lie to taxing authorities? Did he exaggerate the, the, the value that there was in that land in order to get that giant tax break? That's one of the properties that seems to be under scrutiny by both the attorney general and the DA. Yeah, he bought that place, Joe, in 1995 for $7.5 million, appraised in 2015 for $56.5 million. Um, oh, Barbara, wow. Barbara okay. McQuaid, uh, put on your prosecutor's hat here for a moment. Just take a step back for our viewers and explain what it takes for a prosecutor to convene and impanel a grand jury. Uh, it would appear Cy Vance believes there was a crime committed. Again, to underline what Joe said, we don't know who. We don't know if it's Donald Trump or someone else mm -hmm. in his orbit. But what would it take to seat a grand jury in this case? Well, a grand jury has both a charging function and an investigative function. So as long as Cy Vance believes that he has uh, credible allegations that a crime may have been committed, that would be a sufficient basis to convene this grand jury. But I think it's a significant step because we've long known that Cy Vance has documents. And so he has now likely completed his review of those documents. If there were nothing there, nothing to suggest to him that a crime has been committed, there'd be no need to convene this grand jury. So the fact that he has says to me that he has found sufficient evidence in those documents to believe he should take that next step. And in New York, it's necessary to present all of the evidence before a grand jury. It's not enough to rely on hearsay the way it is in federal court. So they need to hear from enough witnesses 
to be convinced that there's probable cause that a crime has occurred. That could take some time. We talked about the six months to see the documents and to hear from the witnesses. But it also performs that investigative function. And so it could be necessary to put people before the grand jury to compel their testimony, either with a subpoena or for witnesses who may be reluctant to work out deals with them, some cooperation deal where they'll get a recommendation of leniency in exchange for coming in and testifying. All of those things are likely to occur in the next six months. So, Paul Butler, what's a reasonable expectation in terms of a timeline here? What We know these grand juries sit and they hear evidence for other cases as well. They're not just seated strictly to hear the investigation evidence into the Trump organization. So what might we expect here? When may we hear that there's charges? What, what could we learn soon? The grand juries are secret. There's no real way of knowing Willie except that this grand jury has been in panel for six months, but that could be extended. So at early in an investigation, grand juries, as Barbara said, subpoena evidence. Now it sounds like this is at the stage where the district attorney believes there's probable cause to charge some thing like the Trump organization or someone with a crime. And often with corporate crimes, People at the top insulate themselves so the middle managers get blamed. The interesting thing about the Trump organization is reportedly all of the decision making was consolidated at the top with Donald Trump Sr., Donald Trump Jr., Erica Ivanka, and Alan Weisselberg. And so those are the people who the grand jurors will be focused on. They probably won't hear from any of them, but other witnesses and documents will try to tell their story. Right. Professor Butler, um, if if, uh, you study Michael Cohen's uh, description of how Trump operates, he often doesn't say much, but he indicates in somewhat of an unspoken language as to what his middle managers should do, and then they end up uh, shouldering a lot of the problems. Um, Explain as if you're explaining to your students what will happen in this grand jury and how uh, Weiselberg could either be a focus of the investigation or could be useful against former President Donald Trump. So the prosecutors will use the grand jury to tell a story and they'll have a lot more evidence than would be admissible if this were a regular trial. And in the grand jury, you don't have to present any of the defense. So it will be both Mm -hmm. a pro-prosecution story, but also one designed to see if this case goes to trial and we charge the Trump organization we charge individuals, then is that an airtight case? Because Mika, you don't charge the organization of the former president, and you certainly don't charge the former president or his family members with the crime unless it's a slam dunk, unless you know you can win. It is Wednesday, the 26th of May of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of those meddlesome priests? They're everywhere, everywhere. Hey, uh, looks like uh, Adam Schiff is on the uh, ball here. He's quite upset. Um, the, apparently the new Manafort court documents show that Manafort was an even bigger liar than we thought. Trump's campaign was colluding with Russian intelligence by giving them sensitive polling data while they were helping his campaign. And Bill Barr purposely misled the country. Well, (laughs) I told you so. And that should be trademarked. I don't know if I can copyright it, but I'm going to trademark it because, well, you know, it is a a term of business now. I told you so. Okay, well, um, i still a bit concerned, as well as many others, with Merrick Garland's DOJ uh, appealing uh, the judge's order to release the rest of the memo, the OLC memo. 
Now, there's been a lot of speculation on why. Uh, some people have brought up, well, you know, there's an ongoing investigation. I don't think that the release of the OLC memo that shows that Trump obstructed justice <laughs> and how is, uh, uh, well, falls under that aegis. Some others have speculated that possibly it would show, well, I this is what I at first thought, that there's probably so much rot in the DOJ itself that the rat hunt could decimate the department to where it couldn't be a functioning department. Maybe Garland sees how bad it is and, you know, he can still work with some people. I don't know. You don't work with Nazis. It's not a good idea. All right. In fact, I have an anecdote. There's two groups of people that you just cannot trust. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this, but heroin addicts and Nazis. You just never know when they're going to turn. You never know when they're going to stab you in the back. But you know they will. (laughs) It doesn't matter. I know it's anecdotal, but still, do not trust a Nazi. Don't. Their whole purpose is to annihilate you and me, too. But (laughs) just being rhetorical, don't trust the Nazis. So, um... Another speculation about why Garland might be appealing this uh, release is that it could implicate maybe the whole of the GOP being a wash in Russian rubles. Now, we know that the NRA passed out a lot of money that was laundered from Russia to influence a particular party. And who was that party? The only one that took the big NRA money because, by and large, most Democrats were rated too low to be able to, by the NRA, to be able to, uh, you know, get the funds. And why would a Democrat want the NRA funds to begin with? So Vladimir Putin looked around and thought, you know, what's, what's an easy mark in America? Who are the marks that will fall for my BS? And he found the GOP and their voters. So I'm not giving these 73 million a break. They are good Republicans, just like the good Germans of old. They are complicit. And if it was me, I'd make him be cleaning up uh, the icebox baby gulags and just to show what they're responsible for. Make them clean it with a toothbrush just to show them the error of their ways. Well, we won't ever do that because, well, you know, we think that we can rehabilitate a Nazi or a good Republican. I don't think so. I really don't. I've made the joke before that to re-educate people, you have to have them educated first to begin with. Just by definition, you can't re-educate that which is not educated already. You have to get educate them first and then re-educate them. So apparently uh, the GOP wants to make sure that nobody in America is educated. Because if they knew the origin story of their country, they might what? become more diverse and accepting of all other people, other people (laughs) can't have that. We have to be an insular tribe, mostly white. You know, we have a few token, you know, just to get our way. (laughs) Okay. It's a fight for the soul of America. And what is the soul of America? I guess if you wanted to make it black and white, you got the Nazis on one side, white, (laughs) <laughs> and all the rest of us. And there's more of us than of them, and let us not forget it. I know there are washing guns. I know that the reason the GOP uh, legislators don't want to leave D.C. during this recess and go home because 
Democrats have said, you know, I've been threatened by some maggot crazy people. They're going to kill me. And that's the same reason that the GOP legislators don't want to go home either. Their lives are being threatened by Trumpanistas. I think that is the definition of terror. When you're influencing political decisions because of the fear of death. Hmm. Yep. One party has practiced eliminationism for decades and the other party, uh, you know, we're concerned. We're very, very concerned. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, the Manhattan D.A. Vance, Cyrus Vance. Wasn't he bought off earlier and dropped this whole investigation, you know, before Trump was like running for office? Well, he's going to bring, well, he has convened a special grand jury in the Trump probe. Mostly because, uh, you know, the state AG and others have been doing some heavy lifting. Indeed. On the rest of the menu, the federal government will issue new cybersecurity rules for U.S. pipeline operators following the recent ransomware attack by Russia. Uh -huh. Mitch McConnell says he wants to focus on attacking President Joe Biden rather than on that partisan January 6th commission. And Obama-era policy advisor... Chiquita Brooks Lesur has been named as the first black woman to run Medicare and Medicaid. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the far right alternative for Germany party picked a couple of hardliners as its top election candidates. Well, what else would they do? And France blasted the pathetic attempts by hostile foreign actors to discredit the Pfizer vaccine online. Yeah, they called up a few influencers and offered them money. How pathetic is that? All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link, across the page, to the left, at the or near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, your recurring Patreon nudge helps us pay our bills so that we can then fly under the radar and continue this resistance radio that has been resisting for over 10 years now by you know, a couple of months now. Uh, yeah, we're celebrating our decade, our decade of resistance radio here at Netroots Radio. And we have you to thank for us being able to do so. We being able to do so. Uh, if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink, as others have, and if you could send those funds our way, we then, well, throw that in the kitty with what we pull out of our own wallets. And uh, we stretch those dollars beyond compare. And then we pay our bills. And then we fly under the radar. And we continue our civic duty as the founders originally intended oh so very long ago. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for considering your generosity in the future. And I also want to give a big shout out to those once again, who have increased their monthly patronage. It is coming at a very, well, it's, it, 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 we need it to be frank. And thank you. 
If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, go to at Netroots Radio. That is so simple. And Tom takes care of that because Tom makes it simple so it can be done. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary. Yes, it's a diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that posted up on Twitter. And, uh, you know, next month I'll put it up on Facebook again when they allow me to. And other social media platforms as well. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And do please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. All right, let us tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yes, it is a salon. (laughs) It is. And uh, it comes... By the Associated Press, but through the American Independent. I had a hard time locating it on at the Associated Press. But uh, here it is, readily available at the American Independent. The federal government will issue cybersecurity regulations in the coming days for U.S. pipeline operators following a ransomware attack that led to fuel shortages across much of the eastern seaboard. It wasn't so much shortages as it was deliveries, but I guess that's considered a shortage of some, of some note. It really was just being able to deliver. Okay, let's be clear. Now, the TSA, which oversees, that's the Transportation Security Administration, which oversees the nation's network of pipelines, is expected to issue a security directive this week that will address some of the issues raised by the Colonial Pipeline shutdown. The directive will include a requirement that pipeline companies report cyber incidents to the federal government, said this official yesterday who announced this. And he was speaking on condition of anonymity because the proposal has not yet been publicly released. They're floating it out there, so there it is. It addresses, to an extent, the ransomware attack that led to the shutdown of the pipeline this month, but it also reflects a broader Biden administration focus on cybersecurity after a series of damaging intrusions by overseas hackers. Do they write the code in Cyrillic? I wonder. The Department of Homeland Security declined to confirm any specifics of the pending directive, issuing a, issuing a statement that said, TSA and another component of the agency, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, are working with private companies to address cyber threats. The Biden administration is taking further action to better secure our nation's critical infrastructure. The Department of Homeland Security said the directive first reported by the Washington Post is expected to prompt concern, if not outright opposition from private operators wary of increased government regulation. Well, if you're going to allow a hostile foreign actor to bribe you to hold you for ransom, then you better expect the law to get involved. They don't want government intrusion. Excuse me. Mark Montgomery, a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and former executive director of the congressionally mandated Cyberspace Solarium Commission, said federal officials have told him the pipeline order will have two stages. The first will immediately mandate that any cybersecurity incidents are reported to the federal government, while the second, coming later, would require the pipeline companies complete a self-assessment of their cybersecurity systems for known vulnerabilities. DHS Secretary Mayorkas, speaking earlier at a news conference about the recovery in domestic air travel as the pandemic eases in the U.S., did not mention the security directive, but said his agency was working with the private sector to improve cyber hygiene to prevent attacks and ensure that businesses can more easily withstand them if their private defenses fail. There are more than 2.7 million miles of pipeline transporting oil and other liquids and natural gas around the U.S. 
Members of Congress have expressed concern about the potential risk to the network, which has grown in recent years, with increasing reliance on computerized systems and electronic data that are vulnerable to cyber attacks and intrusion. The extent of the risk became apparent when Colonial Pipeline was targeted in a ransomware attack that prompted the company to shut down a system that delivers about 45% of the gasoline consumed on the East Coast. The company, based in Alpharetta, Georgia, later disclosed it paid a ransom of $4.4 million to retrieve access to its data from the gang of hackers who broke into its computer systems. The FBI has linked the ransomware to a Russian-speaking criminal syndicate known as DarkSide. And President Joe Biden has said the administration has strong reason to believe the criminals are living in Russia. Singer of the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday, Tuesday, once again dismissed the idea of a bipartisan commission to probe the violent and deadly January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, saying he wants to focus on attacking President Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump in the lead up to the 2022 midterm elections. McConnell made his comments at a Tuesday afternoon news conference on Capitol Hill in which he accused of de Democrats of wanting to litigate the former president president into the future well didn't you do that with hillary and are still doing it now we think that the american people going forward and in the fall of 2022 ought focus on what this administration is doing to the country mcconnell said adding that the january 6th commission framework that passed the house last week on a bipartisan vote is a purely political exercise that adds nothing to the sum total of information the Nuremberg trials would have been considered partisan by your construct, you Nazi. <laughs> what? It's a tacit admission from McConnell that he believes an outside commission would hurt the GOP in its quest to win the House and Senate majorities in the 2022 midterms. Other GOP leaders have already said publicly that they view the commission as a trap to hurt them in the midterms. Well, remember when McCarthy came out and said Benghazi pretty much was just set up to hurt Hillary. And have you ever noticed that every crime they commit, they think the other side's committing worse? Projection, be thy guide. Now, despite McConnell's claim that it would be purely partisan, the commission would be bipartisan in nature, with an equal number of members appointed by Democratic and Republican leaders in Congress. Any subpoenas would require support from a majority of the commission's members, meaning GOP-appointed commissioners would have to vote to approve them. And no one wants to go on record that they said to subpoena anything for, to do with Trump, because, as we already know, their lives have been physically threatened personally, and so have their families, because... When you negotiate with terrorists, this is what happens. Even some Republicans disputed McConnell's claim that a January 6th commission would be partisan and a misstep for Republicans. Senator Bill Cassidy told reporters on Capitol Hill that if Senate Republicans reject the commission, congressional Democrats will launch their own partisan commission that could be even worse for the GOP. Comparing it, to Republicans' Benghazi investigation that helped doom Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential bid. Democrats, for their part, are up in arms over his opposition to the commission. 
His members' lives were threatened. Representative Don Beyer, from a Democrat from Virginia, tweeted in response to McConnell's comments, not their jobs, their lives. The lives of the vice president and the Speaker of the House were threatened. It isn't political to try to find out how that happened. It is common sense. Trying to hide the truth on purpose is political. Now, ultimately, McConnell's opposition makes it unlikely there will be 10 GOP Senate votes to avoid a filibuster. You know who Manchin called 10 patriots. Aren't there 10 patriots here? No, there's not. Filibustering a commission to examine a domestic terrorist attack on the Capitol could give Democrats ammunition to ditch the arcane Senate procedure known as the filibuster. Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes our way by the Associated Press. The Senate yesterday, Tuesday, confirmed President Joe Biden's pick to run U.S. health insurance programs, putting in place a key player who will carry out his strategy for expanding affordable coverage and reining in prescription drug costs. Obama era policy advisor Ch- Chiquita Brooks Lassure, or is it Lassure? will be the first black person to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, which also administers Children's Health Insurance and the Affordable Care Act. Together, the programs cover more than 130 million people from newborns to nursing home residents and plays a central role in the nation's health care system. The Senate vote was 55 to 44, with five Republicans joining Democrats in approving her nomination. B- Brooks Lesseur had been expected to win stronger bipartisan support, but a controversy over a CMS action affecting the Medicaid program in Republican-led Texas appears to have spoiled those chances. It's always Texas. During her confirmation hearing before the Senate Finance Committee, Brooks Lesseur paid homage to generations of black women and men in public service who came before her. Too often, they were not given the opportunity to live up to their full God-given potential, she said, but their selfless, often silent sacrifice paved the way for me and so many other women of color. Brooks Lesseur, age 46, has spent most of her career in government under administrations of both parties. She served in the White House Budget Office during the Republican administration of George W. Bush and worked in Congress and at CMS in senior policy roles during the Barack Obama years. Under under Biden, she will be charged with moving toward his goal of health insurance for all Americans by building on existing programs particularly the Obama health law, the ACA. Biden's COVID-19 relief bill has greatly expanded subsidies for private plans offered through healthcare.gov, a feature that the administration wants to make permanent. Part of her portfolio will include reviewing and amending or rolling back a series of Trump administration changes to health insurance rules. Under Trump, CMS tried to promote the sale of cheaper private insurance that offered less coverage than plans sold under the ACA. Many Democrats want restrictions on short-term plans that do not cover pre-existing conditions. We're back to that. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will 
and finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, smoldering. It can be hard to think of movie stars as real people with real problems that shape what we see of their lives, but they are. Those Who Want Me Dead is here because Angelina Jolie liked the project, and she liked it because it fit where she's at right now. For the past few years, she's been mostly off-camera. She's done voice work, she's directed, which she likes, but now she's on screen again. Why? Because she's getting divorced and is dealing with custody issues, and she doesn't have the time that directing requires. Hence this movie and this particular movie. In Those Who Want Me Dead, Jolie plays Hannah, a smoke jumper, a firefighter who parachutes into wildfires, who no longer jumps and is healing her emotional wounds in a watchtower. It's there that she sees a young boy stumble out of the forest. He's being chased by killers, and now so is she. So it's a thriller, it's a survival story, there's action, but Jolie doesn't have to learn martial arts. She doesn't have to train. She just has to get beaten up, which is a thing these days, have you noticed? So many movies and shows where characters go through them, bloodied, bruised, and otherwise physically wounded. What is that about? Anyway, Jolie also wanted a chance to work with actor-turned-screenwriter Sakaro Yellowstone, screenwriter-turned-director Taylor Sheridan, and if her co-stars are to be believed, Jolie is not the only one who appreciates Sheridan's affinity for nouveau westerns that have some grit and a focus on strong relationships. Speaking of relationships, not only does Jolie not have to be superhuman here, she also doesn't have to be super mom. Hannah is tough with her child charge, which Jolie says was a new character direction for her, which I find notable because I have long said one of the joys of Maleficent was watching Angelina Jolie, who loves children, play someone who tries not to fall in love with a child and fails. Now, you might expect Those Who Want Me Dead to be this big, high-powered, star vehicle action film. That's not what it is. It's more this ensemble-like, even-paced thriller. It would be a quiet movie if they hadn't burned down a forest to make it. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Nearly 350 years ago, the Dutch scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek scraped some white stuff off his teeth, as thick as if it were batter, he wrote, and peered at it under one of his handmade microscopes. What he saw was alive. He described it as many very little living animacules, very prettily a-moving, the biggest of which shot through the water or spittle like a pike does through the water. What he had discovered in the plaque from his teeth, the animacules, that was bacteria. And before von Leeuwenhoek's observations of bacteria... Nobody could have discovered bacteria because they didn't have the optical resolution. Lambert van Eyck is a material scientist at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He says some of von Leeuwenhoek's microscopes could magnify things more than 200 times. And contemporaries like Robert Hooke in England, who'd written a book full of microscopic observations... They were stunned by his findings. Robert Hooke actually spent quite some effort trying to discover why was Anthony Verlewoek so skilled and what kind of mysterious ways of producing the lenses made him able to see for the first time bacteria. But von Leeuwenhoek wasn't eager to reveal the secrets behind the hundreds of microscopes he built. Some people have explicitly asked him about the lenses and he, he never said anything about it. It's still a big mystery how these lenses were made after 350 years. And the only way that they could discover would be to uh, break it open. And then you would obviously see what the lens would be like, but they're too precious. That's where Lambert von Eyck comes in. He and his colleagues were able to peer inside several of von Leeuwenhoek's microscopes with a non-destructive technique called neutron tomography. It's the same idea as a CT scan, but it uses neutrons instead of x-rays. And what they found surprised them. Instead of using lens types unknown to other scientists of his day, von Leeuwenhoek had just installed a common type of ground and polished lens in one of the microscopes they examined, and in the other, one of his most powerful scopes, he had used a globe-shaped lens produced by flameworking, 
a lens type that his scientific competitor, Robert Hooke himself, had already described. And so now the ironical thing is that actually, most likely, it's the method of Robert Hooke himself that uh, Anthony Valéu used. The findings are in the journal Science Advances. Van Eyck points out that von Leeuwenhoek was still an extremely skilled craftsman and glass grinder, able to build the finest microscopes of his day. And his discoveries of blood cells and sperm cells, parasites and bacteria, they were altogether extraordinary. It just seems the types of lenses he used to do that work were anything but. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. The Agriculture Commissioner of Texas, Sid Miller, is the one top official in our state willing to take a bold stand against racial discrimination. Miller proudly went to court in April, challenging a new government program that he considered discriminatory against a particular group of disadvantaged agricultural producers, namely his group, white farmers and ranchers. Yes, Sid asserts that the program, which directs some long-overdue loan relief to black, Latino, Native American, and other food producers who've been grossly discriminated against for generations by agricultural lenders, amounts to reverse discrimination against privileged whites like him. So Sid, a rancher and former rodeo performer is braying and snorting through his big white cowboy hat that the way to stop racial discrimination is to let white discriminators also get anti-discrimination money from the feds. That's what passes for logic when you're wearing a $1,000 hat like Sid struts around in. But, as a real cowboy once told me, it ain't the hat, it's the head. And right there is Miller's problem. He's got a $1,000 hat on a 10-cent head. However, he's not the actual thinker behind this screwball legal claim. That distinction goes to another Miller, one named Stephen. He's a Trump political operative, anti-immigrant extremist, and a fanatical promoter of white nationalism, one who specializes in frivolous lawsuits. Indeed, Stephen wrote Sid's plaintive legal plea to provide racial justice for rich and powerful white ranchers like him. This is Jim Hightower saying, You'd think this ridiculous bigotry would be laughed out of court, but the case has gone to a hyper-partisan right-wing judge who's backed Republican legal ploys in the past. So yippee ti yay off to another right-wing rodeo we go. The eyes of Texas are upon you. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute, and that's the most famous line of the anthem of the University of Texas at Austin, the melody of which is the same as I've been working on the railroad. It's performed before every sporting event and at commencement. The anthem was first performed in Austin in 1903 by white students in blackface, a minstrel show depicting black Americans as dim-witted and happy in their position of servitude. Those shows continued until the mid-1960s. And the melody is derived from a minstrel tune about black laborers building levees across the South. That said, a university committee formed to study the song reported last spring that the song had, quote, no racist intent. Complaints about implicit, if not explicit, undertones of racism in this song are longstanding and now have come to a head in protests that have pitted large donors and administrators against student tour guides who have gone on strike over this, black legislators, and state activists. So far, the rich donors are winning. J.B. Byrd, a university spokesman, recently confirmed that, quote, the eyes of Texas is and will remain 
our alma mater. So the fight goes on. The eyes of Texas are upon you all the live long day. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. And you cannot get away. I'm Rick Smith. And this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day the Steelworkers Organizing Committee, or SWAC, called a nationwide strike against three of the four little steel companies, Republic, Inland, and Youngstown Sheet and Tube. The drive to organize Little Steel came on the heels of an historic agreement with U.S. Steel and j l earlier in the year. In his book, The Last Great Strike, legal scholar Ahmed White points out that SWAC leaders established a three-pronged strategy in their organizing efforts. To break down racial and ethnic diversities among workers, to use the Wagner Act and newly formed NLRB to their advantage whenever possible, and to take over company unions where they existed. They hoped Little Steel would follow earlier precedent, but mill owners wouldn't budge on union recognition. Firing of organizers intensified and lockouts began. Sheriff's departments began the swearing-in of deputies. Republic and Youngstown Sheet and Tube started shipping and stockpiling munitions, including machine guns and tear gas, to mills throughout the Midwest and Northeast. Scattered walkouts and wildcats began throughout the latter part of May as SWAC continued to demand recognition and first contracts. And on this day, SWAC delegates from the Little Steel locals met in a Youngstown War Council to demand a strike. The strike began late that evening with the shift change at 11 p.m. The mills were shut down tight. Pitched battles between strikers, scabs, and police continued throughout the summer with hundreds arrested. Anti-union violence would explode with the Memorial Day Massacre in South Chicago and the Women's Massacre in Youngstown the following month. After five months, the strike collapsed. It would take until 1942 before recognition was finally won. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 48 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of around 82. Sunshine and a few afternoon clouds, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. A few clouds overnight with lows in the mid-40s, winds will be out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Mostly cloudy tomorrow with only a high of around 70 to 72, a slight chance of a rain shower. And winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon stands at 11,144 with 143 confirmed deceased. Grass pollen is rated very high right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 24 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is very high at 9. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.16 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 90%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 61 and partly cloudy. Paris is 60 degrees with rain. Rome is 75 and sunny. Kiev is 63 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 75 and fair. Hong Kong is 81 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 68 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 57 degrees and clear. 
San Francisco, California is 52 degrees and fair. And New York, New York is 75 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Germany's far-right alternative for Germany party, the AFD, picked two hardliners yesterday, Tuesday, to lead the party into a September national election, dealing a blow to its more moderate wing. Some 71% of party members favored the duo of Alice Weidel and Tino Trupela as its top candidates in an online vote against a more mainstream pair. The anti-immigrant party is pulling at around 11%, down from nearly 13 in the 2017 election, after which it became the main opposition. Set up in 2013 as an anti-Euro party during the Eurozone debt crisis, the AFD has shifted to the right and capitalized on voter anger over Conservative Chancellor Angela Merkel's open-door policy towards migrants in 2015. It became the third largest party in the 2017 election. The AFD harbors many coronavirus deniers who oppose vaccinations against COVID-19 and joined anti-lockdown protests. The party's election manifesto also includes a call to leave the EU. Germany's mainstream parties refuse to cooperate with it. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Anonymous staff at Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Several French social media sites say they have been approached by a communications agency which offered them money to spread neck to spread negative publicity about the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, a ploy the health minister described as dangerous and irresponsible. Leo Grasset, whose dirty biology YouTube channel has more than a million subscribers, said on his uh, Twitter account that he had been offered money to criticize the shot. I have received a partnership proposal to bust the Pfizer vaccine in video. Huge budget. A client who wants to remain anonymous. If you see videos about this, you will know that it is a setup. He added that the address of London-based agency which had contacted him was a fake. It was not clear how many people have received such requests, where they originated, or why they targeted the Pfizer vaccine, the most commonly administered in France, a country which has a tradition of vaccine skepticism. In April, an EU report said that Russian and Chinese media were systematically seeking to sow mistrust in Western COVID-19 vaccines in their disinformation campaigns aimed at the West. And uh, I do not know where this comes from. From France or abroad, French Health Minister Olivier Véran said, It is pathetic. It is dangerous. It is irresponsible. And it does not work. Well, let's hope so. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Networks Radio broadcasts on 
And we will meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Jardin d'hiver, para tapir a tampa.